Hey there everyone, it's your old pal Cape Joel again, trying something a little bit different today. It's been a few days now, but you may have noticed this week saw the big finale for Axe Judgment Day, Marvel's big new summer event. Overall, I genuinely enjoyed the story. I was actually quite pleasantly surprised that for once this was a big massive Marvel event wherein all of the tie-ins were genuinely important and enjoyable in their own right. All the credit in the world has to be given to Kieran Gillen because this had to be one a hell of a very very creative undertaking for him. He wrote about 18 of the tie-ins himself. And I gotta say, now that I've had time to really digest the book and really think about it, I think this one is going to have some major ripple effects throughout the rest of the Marvel Universe. Change in comics, especially big sweeping change from something like event comics is something that doesn't happen all the time. The illusion of change is a big thing in comic books and comic book stories. But here I thought, you know, it would be fun if we actually looked back and actually discuss some of the biggest things that came out of Judgment Day and what they might mean going forward. I had asked my followers on Twitter if they had wanted to see me make a video like this, maybe people who wanted to know what was going on in the greater Marvel Universe but didn't want to have to sit through, like I said, 18 other videos I did when they could just, you know, watch one. And the whole thing is really serendipitous, too, because YouTube is prioritizing shorter, more focused content anyway. I know my friend Sal over at Comic Pop has had great success with videos like this. So I thought, hey, you know, let me try my hand at this. At best, people like it, and maybe I'll make it a recurring segment on the channel, and if people don't like it, well, then at least the patrons get something fun and cool first, right? I guess the first big question we should try and answer first is, what is Judgment Day? Well, its full title is actually Axe Judgment Day. That's Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals, and it's a massive summer event that, you know, crossed over all of these different big team series. The inciting incident, of course, involved Droog, the slimy ever villain of the Eternal series of books becoming the brand new Eternal Prime and using this power and authority to start a completely trumped up holy war against the X-Men and their brand new nation of Krakoa. Of course, Droog had no real reason to start this fight. He was only picking it so he could hold on to the power that he just barely managed to grab during the end of the other Kieran Gillen Eternal series, which has been really great in case you've been wondering. I was never a huge Eternal fan, but I like the way Gillen writes it. The big smoking gun gun that Droog attempt to use to gather other Eternals to his cause is to say that Mutantum is actually not all that different from the Deviants that they have been more or less designed to destroy. And I guess, canonically speaking, that is the big first major change we need to discuss here. Genetically speaking, mutants and Deviants aren't actually that different. In fact, in the story itself, we saw Crow and the other Deviants use Krakoan portals because they can, even though no one else can, unless they're actively being escorted by a mutant. It's it's implied near the end of the story, too, that Zurus, the guy who's usually always shown to be Eternal Prime, knew that this was the case for hundreds, maybe even millions of years, but actively didn't choose to pursue it because as far as he saw it, Deviants might share a lot with mutants, but mutants never actively exceeded the excessive deviation that him and the other Eternals were created to try and stop. In fact, in the pages of the main Kieran Gillen Eternals book, the implication is that Deviants themselves were kind of the Earth and the universe working out superpowered individuals for the first time. This would, of course, explain why Earth and the Marvel Universe is home to so many people with amazing powers, be they mutants, be they radioactive spider people or gamma hulks. Again, this isn't the first time we've seen this idea played with. Uh, Jason Aaron in his Avengers book with the first host also seek to imply these ideas, but it's Gillen who kind of crystallizes it. Now, the other big change in this story relates to the top topic of mutants and their resurrection protocols. Of course, if you've been reading the Krakoa era, you'll know thanks to the power of the five, mutant kind has basically defeated death as a metaphysical concept. They can die, but because they're backed up in Cerebro, and because the five are such powerful mutants, they're basically able to be reborn over and over again. This was a closely guarded national secret of Krakoa that they went to great lengths to try and hide. That is, of course, until uh, the main Jerry Duggan X-Men book, where Ben Urick starts investigating the mutant resurrection protocols and eventually with the help of Cyclops outs the secret to the rest of the world. Cyclops of course not really seeing eye to eye with Xavier and the Krakoan Council these days. This of course makes the rest of humanity really angry and really jealous at the mutants for basically hogging the secret to eternal life and the big question is will the mutants eventually be forced to share with everyone else? And at the end of the Judgment Day story they are indeed ultimately forced to share. In fact Captain America Steve Rogers becomes the very first human 
human who gets resurrected via the Five and the Mutant Resurrection Protocols. Which begs very many, many questions that Judgment Day as a book kind of has to gloss over because it's an event story and they gotta move on to the next thing. Steve isn't a mutant and as such he wouldn't have his brain backed up in Cerebro, so the question then becomes what exactly did they use to back him up? Is this still the Steve we know or has something actually changed with him either on a mental level or on a physical level? Also, just to spitball and theorize here for a second, I've always personally had the idea in the back of my head that these mutant resurrections can't be nearly as perfect and cost-free as they let on, and that it's only a matter of time before they inevitably decide to reset the status quo for the X-Men and mutant kind by getting rid of the resurrection protocols, or by revealing that there's some dark secret behind them which would now end up actually roping in Captain America to it all. I have to wonder if this is a storyline they're going to pursue. Is this something we would see in the X-Men book or in Cap's solo book, especially because there is a lot happening in the Captain America books right now. By the end of the story, too, Steve isn't even the only human who's been resurrected by the X-Men. In fact, Jean Grey starts up the brand new Phoenix Institute, a humanitarian group operating independently of Krakoa that sees to try and use the mutant's resurrection protocols to try and help the downtrodden, the ostracized, and the oppressed of humanity. The idea being that they're all hated and feared, much like mutant kind, and as such, they should be working together, not against each other. Actually, that sentiment was kind of Magneto's idea. Which, speaking of Magneto, he died in this storyline, and as far as I know, he's still dead, and the reason he doesn't get resurrected is because him and Storm were on planet Erico. Krakoa's Mars colony, in an attempt to try and ingratiate themselves to the more militant and warlike locals, Eric had actually taken himself out of the resurrection protocols. Meaning that when he actually bit it in the big fight with Uranus in the middle part of the Judgment Day event, I think he's actually gonna stay dead, maybe for a little bit. Why would they want to kill off Magneto now of all times? Well, I can't be 100% certain, but if I was a betting man and if I was to theorize, I would say maybe it has something to do with the brand new X-Men movie that is no doubt upcoming. There's been a lot of talk about maybe updating and changing the Magneto character as we know it to make it a little bit more topical and a little bit more timely and so they don't have to explain how a survivor of the Holocaust is still spry and running around in 2022 or probably later by the time that movie comes out. Maybe they want to leave him dead for a little bit so they can justify bringing him back later looking different, maybe doing some colorblind casting. I'm not sure and again this is X-Men so he could probably just pop up again in X-Men Red a week from now and I'll look stupid. But I thought it was worth bringing up here just because. Speaking of X-Men Red and Mars too, at the end of the story the Celestial Progenitor ended up turning back the clock a little bit and undoing most of the damage that was caused during the Judgment Day event, but not all of it. Mars got royally jacked up by Uranus, the great great ancestor of Thanos who looks a lot like him. Well, actually Thanos looks like him because that's how relation works, but still. Gillen actually did a lot in that Eternals book to rework Uranus into this big bad boogeyman threat, and I really did think he was going to end up being the true secret villain of Judgment Day, but no, he actually survives the story and is still in prison. In fact, him and Droog end up getting locked up in the same subspace cell at the end of the story, and it's heavily implied that the Eternals, as part of their effort to try and make amends to the X-Men for the whole Holy War thing, are going to be giving Droog two storms so that they can punish him on Mars for his crimes. In fact, they imply that they're going to make him bury all of the dead single-handedly, which is just a hilarious image and something we do actually end up seeing later on. And speaking of the dead, there were like a billion humans who died because of this event. A lot of them did end up coming back, but they remember the whole dying thing. It's not like that got wiped from their minds. I also alluded to it earlier, but it's also important to mention that at the end of this story, the Eternals basically bend a knee and swear an oath of friendship to the mutants of Krakoa, meaning that they're now officially allies. Obviously, of course, if you've been reading the X-Men book, you'll know full well that in that series, they've been cutting deals, shaking hands, making friends all over the known universe, and now the Eternals are part of their war chest too. It's pretty impressive. Another major change in this series is the shifting opinions of humanity when it comes to the Eternals. You see, the big new thing that Kieran Gillen invented for his Eternals run is explaining how they're able to cheat death every time. And the answer is actually kind of dark and messed up. You see, every time an Eternal comes back to life, a random human in the world ends up dying, meaning that the Eternal race themselves are kind of parasites. And humanity now starts treating them as such, hating and fearing them much in the same way they fear and hate mutant kind. 
mind, if anything, they probably hate them more now. It was Cersei who actually ended up revealing this information to the rest of the world as part of the bigger celestial judgment test, and in the end, she ended up friggin' dying. In fact, she wasn't even the only Eternal who didn't make it out of this story, either. Ajax had actually had a big, long, involved storyline that ran throughout this event in all the different times, where we basically see her, the most fanatical celestial worshipper of the Eternals, basically have to learn to de-radicalize herself. And in the end, Ajax actually sorta kind of fuses with the celestial progenitor, becoming a brand new being called Ajax Celestia. It's all actually very zen and very cosmic to see Ajax, a character who, you know, while being fanatical to her gods, was also kind of angry at other celestials for not being the god that she wanted them to be, but now here she kind of becomes the god that she always wanted to worship. I feel like this is one of those things that's going to be explored in much more depth over in the Eternals book once that starts back up again. I just think it's very fascinating in this age of multimedia where the comics more and more go out of their way to try and reflect the movies they actually got rid of both Cersei and Ajax when we know that they were, well, pretty big parts of that Eternals movie. I mean, from a story standpoint, thematically speaking, it all makes perfect sense. You just have to wonder, did Kieran Gillen have to fight tooth and nail for that, or is this one of those things they plan to just undo later on? Then there's the Avengers, who decide that they're going to keep their current base of operations inside the hollowed-out body of what ended up becoming the Celestial Progenitor. They say they plan to do it as a warning to any other rogue space god out there that would attempt to make trouble, which is very funny in and of itself, but I also like they floated around the idea of, hey, should we go back to the mansion, maybe? But yeah, geez, it really does feel like a hundred years since the Avengers were back in the mansion, am I right? There's also the matter of Orchis, the major mutant-hating syndicate that is a major focus of all the different collected X-Men books right now. They, in what seemed like the final minutes of Earth's existence, actually joined for forces with all the other heroes to try and push back the Celestial Progenitor, and it would seem that because of that and because of shifting opinions on mutant kind and on eternal kind, Orchis actually made out like bandits on this one here and ended up having a great cause to recruit more people. In fact, at the end of the story, we get a really chilling image of a little kid walking around with an Orchis shirt and they have a big Nimrod balloon, which would seek to imply that the toxic Orchis ideology is spread all over the world now, which is scary for both mutant and eternal kind. Of course, what no one knows is that Orchis is actually secretly run by robots, and they don't actually care about humanity at all, they're just using them as cannon fodder. Because Omega Sentinel is actually a time traveler, and she knows full well at the end of all things, it's just going to be mutants versus robots to see who will inherit the universe. It also doesn't help, too, that the Phoenix Institute, while certainly sounding good on paper, also feels like a lot of half measures. Jean even said in the big finale that the mutants of Krakoa are still 100% dedicated to their 10-year plan of trying to bring back as many lost and dead mutants as possible, and that they're really only freeing up 5% of the five's time to try and bring back humans in need. And because there's always a sinister or even cynical undercurrent to the miracles of Krakoa, they chose to do it for sick children and people in need because they knew full well no one could have a problem with that. Some other minor things that may actually end up being much more important later on, especially in the Eternal book. Uh, Faustus had gone to the machine that is Earth and was forced to restart it, which actually ended up being one of the saddest moments in the entire event because the machine that is Earth was essentially the narrator of the Kieran Gillen Eternal series, and now it's lost its personality and it's back to being cold and robotic like it surely was at the beginning of time. Seriously, I'm not joking though. If you haven't read that Kieran Gillen Eternal series, the machine that is Earth is like my favorite character. It's an omnipotent narrator that's filled with sass and self-awareness. And even in the main Judgment Day story, which, you know, asks a lot of really difficult questions about theology and philosophy, I think one of the best standout moments is when the machine that is Earth actually stands up to try and protect humanity, despite the fact that humanity in one way or another has been trying to destroy the Earth since, like, forever. Another thing that came out of Judgment Day that I ended up really liking a lot more than I thought I was going to is the return of Star Fox former Avenger, alien sex pervert, and all-around cosmic adventurer. Eros, brother of Thanos, got himself a big old androgynous, sexy movie-adjacent makeover, and I gotta say, it's a solid look. It's a good look. They also tried really hard in his tie-in issue to address a lot of the more uncomfortable aspects of Eros' 
history as a character. Basically, he can make you feel love and attraction, and he always hasn't used those powers in good ways. In fact, in a great moment of character building, Eros basically has the chance to change the hearts and minds of everyone on Earth so they'll be able to pass the Celestial's judgment, but he chooses not to because he knows that if he did, he would be doing it against people's wills and messing with their autonomy. Basically, he doesn't want to make people good, they have to choose to be good on their own, lest it doesn't count, and even if it didn't, that would still be, you know, again, not doing shit with consent, which he doesn't want to do anymore. Another big revelation from that story, too, is that Eros, because he was one of the Titan Eternals who broke off from the rest of Eternal society, he shouldn't be able to be integrated into the machine that is Earth so he can be resurrected, but somehow his mother was able to break all the rules and do what even Thanos and Mentor couldn't do, meaning that not only is Star Fox back in the Marvel fold, but they basically seek to imply that he's maybe the most important one-of-a-kind Eternal ever. I really hope we get to see more of him in the Eternal series, but Al, I'd also really enjoy a new Star Fox mini. I'd happily read it. And now this last one I just thought of at the final moments right here, right now, and that is Mr. Sinister is the only character in this big event that didn't get judged. Everyone else got judged. Some passed, some failed, some were happy with the judgment, some were angry at it, some called out the Celestial on their hypocrisy, yet somehow, some way, Mr. Sinister was able to dodge judgment all series long. Now, maybe this has something to do with the fact that he's messed with Celestial DNA before, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the next big X-Men event, Sins of Sinister, is going to be focusing on him. I can't say for certain, but it definitely seems like Kieran Gillen is actively trying to raise Mr. Sinister's profile, and it certainly helps a lot that Sinister is a major character over in the Immortal X-Men book that Kieran Gillen is also writing and used as a launch pad for a lot of the stuff that actually went on in Judgment Day, and it seems like that ball is just going to keep on rolling into the future now. It's also important to note that Sinister isn't the only version of himself right now. Orchis has their own Mr. Sinister called Dr. Stasis, who may or may not just be the human parts of Nathaniel Essex running around in another clone body. We do know they're different, though, because while our Mr. Sinister has the very traditional red diamond on his forehead that he always had, Dr. Stasis actually has a black club on his head, which if we're going with the playing card motif, does that mean that there's a red heart and spade-themed Mr. Sinister running around out there? Maybe they'll be involved in Sins of Sinister. Uh, if I had to bet, that's where I would put my money. And yeah, that's basically the long and short of it, everyone. That was Axe Judgment Day, a Marvel event that I feel actually did end up changing quite a lot. And I personally feel like we're going to be living with the fallout of this story for a while now, and I thought that it would be really fun and cool to get you all up to speed on everything that you may have missed, not just in the event itself, but in all the different related books surrounding it. I hope you liked the video. I know I don't always get a chance to experiment and screw around with different video concepts, because I don't know if you've noticed, but new comic books come out every single week, and there's a lot to cover, especially during event time, when, like I said, there's like 18 new tie-ins I have to cover. If you do enjoy the format, this kind of more, you know, straight talk, no frills approach to talking about all the big things happening in Marvel stories right now, be sure to let me know. Maybe when Dark Crisis wraps up, we'll come back and we'll do this all again. Though, admittedly, not to give too much away, I feel like not that much has actually happened in Dark Crisis, and that story is also almost over. I know a lot of people have been asking me too, hey Joel, are you going to get back to reviewing Thor? Are you going to get back to reviewing Venom or Hulk or all those other books? There are so many books I have wanted to cover, but I haven't been able to because of Judgment Day and because of Dark Crisis and because of the dozens of tie-ins. And maybe now that things have finally calmed down, I can actually get back in there and talk about them for real this time. Until next time, everyone, thank you so much for watching and listening, though more listening than watching again. One of these things I wanted to do is maybe hoping I can get it out sooner if I'm not worried about, you know, brushing my hair or putting on a new shirt that I feel like you guys haven't seen a hundred times. Just Getting back to my podcast roots, everyone. You love to see it, and here's hoping the YouTube algorithm likes it as much as we do.